Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices below. Lights, camera, action. Welcome back, gorgeous visionaries. It's so good to have you back here with me on today's episode, which is going to be a rather yummy one, if I might say so myself. Our next guest wanted to be a kids presenter. Actually, she'd still love to do this. She's bright, bold, effervescent. Her experience and stamina can be felt through the web with her vibrant personality. But now listen, she wasn't born to the manor, and she certainly didn't have everything handed to her on a plate. She comes from a very humble background. Her parents split up when she was young, and she was raised by a single mum, which wasn't easy, especially when they were homeless at one point. But believe me, our next guest would give me a right old nudge right about now, because she cannot stand sob stories, only because she truly believes that even in the shit you can grow roses. She learned from a young age to take care of herself and how to make her way in the world. She learned the value of working and earning her own money, and she's never looked back. Now, our next guest isn't a life coach or a business coach. Mm-mm-mm. She curates the process and team for TED Talks, and she coaches those wanting to be on a TED stage and looking on how to apply. A <coughs> oh, what? Oh, yes, I hear you. Perhaps you've never heard of TED or the prestige it holds for those who want to spread their message across the world and how desired or coveted it is for entrepreneurs wanting to be selected to be on the TED stage. Well, in that case, I think it's time I stop introducing and start giving our next guest the stage and a gorgeous welcome. Here she is, folks, and I hope I get this right. The one and only Minnie von Melinkrot Gran. Hello, Minnie. Hello. <laughs> Ten points for getting my name right. <laughs> Yay! I like it when there's a challenge. It's a, <laughs> it's, a long, it's a long surname. I thought mine was long, but this is like, oh yeah, all right, okay, there's a tongue twister. <laughs> How the heck are you today? I'm really good. I'm excellent. I just got back from a bike ride Ooh. and prepped all my meals for the next few days. Oh my God. And then here I am now. So I'm very organized with my uh, exercise and nutrition. I do it all in the morning. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't do it. <laughs> no pressure, people. No pressure. No, no pressure. No, no. Oh, my God. So before we move forward, share yeah. with us and the listeners and for those that don't know, what is a TED and why is it so coveted by entrepreneurs and thought leaders? So TED was a conference that was started in the mid 80s in, the, in North America. I think it was Monterey Bay. I can't remember exactly. And the idea of the conference was to bring together at that time the emerging um, talk around technology, entertainment and design, the emerging um, congruence of those three industries coming together. So it was run for a few years in North America and it proved to be very successful. And a guy called Chris Anderson, who is a British guy actually, he went over and he took over the TED brand and fundamentally changed a few things about how the TED brand is sort of delivered. So what he did is he actually decided to take the philosophy of TED and turn it into an independently organized event called TEDx. And that event is run by people in anywhere and everywhere. It's been run in universities, towns, um, prisons even. Wow. <laughs> and apparently there's one coming in a refugee camp soon. So it's just amazing. Wow. And the point of TED is about the tagline is ideas worth spreading. Now, what Chris Anderson did with that was brilliant because it got the TED brand out into a more global platform. And so the TED conference today still goes, but there are other ones now. So there's the main TED conference. And to get a spot speaking on the main TED stage is like quite tough. Um, they really do. And it's not that TEDx people don't vet you. They do. It's just there's such so few events in a year. 
and there's only a few speaking slots that it's easier to get an opportunity to speak on the TEDx stage. And um, there's also now TED Women mm. to encourage more female voices on the stage, to encourage more women to step up and start spreading their ideas. There's TED Youth, which is for obviously children. And there's TED Global, which is the TED conference, but it's taken all around the world in different venues. So you've got all these different kind of spin-offs from TED, but fundamentally the idea is still the same. It's about really getting your ideas out into the world and really spreading your ideas. Now, the reason why it's been so successful is because it's gone global, but also because the TED and TEDx YouTube channels are two of the most watched channels on YouTube. So once you actually do a TED or a TEDx talk or any kind of TED talk, you have a video made and that gets sent to head office. They look at it, they approve it and they put it on the TEDx YouTube channel. And therefore you're actually now on a global platform and people who are avid TED watchers will go onto the YouTube channel and they will type in keywords around subject areas they maybe want to learn about. And potentially, obviously, if you've got your video tagged up correctly, your video could be seen and watched by people so you're really it's about you getting your message out there and that's why thought leaders in particular like that platform because it's a real leveler it's open to anybody and unlike some platforms where you know if it's a specific conference then you know you have to sort of have all these accolades and be known and be in that little gang little in gang or have a speaker (laughs) agent or whatever this takes all of that away and that it allows anybody anybody with an idea and a message that's powerful that can change the world and impact the world to get on that stage and tell their story and tell their view or perspective on why this idea is relevant and why it needs to be adopted by as many people as possible. So it's not just about doing a talk and inspiring people. It's not really a platform for motivational speakers per se, who are like, you know, this happened and oh, it was awful. And then I came back and look at me now. And, That format is done over and over again, and it's done to death. And actually, as a curator this year, I watched a curation webinar with Chris Anderson himself and the head of curation in the US. And they both said, you know, no more, no more motivational speakers kind of had enough of them now. Hmm. We want to see something more. So, and I've taken that on board this year, curating for my event. We actually don't have any motivational speakers at all. (laughs) And I thought we probably couldn't run the event with at least one or two because we do get a lot of them and their stories are amazing. But I hear a lot of stories every day and I've heard a lot of mind blowing stories already. So without knocking anyone's story, you can become a little bit immune to it, actually. And I understand where Chris Anderson is coming from with his philosophy, because it's really about the bigger ideas that are out there that are not getting enough airplay. Mm. It's really that kind of platform. So the people you think would get a TED Talk don't necessarily get one. I know sometimes when we announce speakers, they're like, well, well, how come that person got chosen and not me? And it's like, because they had this angle Mm. and they said it this way. You're saying stuff that I've heard before. Mm. None of this is new for me. So I guess I hear a lot. So I probably think, oh, I've heard it all before. (laughs) But actually, when you start doing it a lot, you start to think, actually, yeah, I've heard a lot of stuff um, already. And it's trying to find, and I'm quite good at helping people like, oh, have you thought of it this way? What about that way? Or asking the questions to dig it out of them. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's up to the TED, it's up to the speaker to be able to like really find that thing and go deeper with themselves and find those real angles and nuggets they can use and their real ability to let go of their ego and actually just step into who they really are Mm. and say stuff that might actually upset some people. Mm. Actually, it's that stuff that we are like, wow, okay. Yeah. This is probably going to like be a bit controversial, but as long as you've got the evidence to back it up, then you're fine. You're good. Yeah, that's true. Because around the world, each TEDx talk and each organization that's putting it together, not organization, what's it called? Franchise. They all have a theme. Does that theme then come from head office or is it individually chosen? Yeah, it's individually chosen. So the only involvement, so TED doesn't actually have any involvement in a TEDx event. So, Uh well, it has a little bit, a tiny little bit, but not, not that much. So when you're a TED organizer, you apply to get a license. So you said franchise, it's a similar thing, but it's actually just a license. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can put on a TED event in a year and you are responsible for finding your speakers, making sure that there is a standard, organizing the event, organizing the videos to happen, getting volunteers together to come and help you because it's a nonprofit. 
Mm-hmm. So as an organizer, you do have to pay for some stuff. You have to pay for like, sometimes you have to pay for the venue and the food and the audio visual and stuff like that. But sometimes you don't. And so it depends on the level of event you're going to depends on how much they can invest in that with sponsorship and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to it. But the idea is that the licensee puts on their event. It's their theme. It's their decision. The only time TED really get involved is when the videos get sent back to the TED head office to be approved and put onto the main YouTube channel. TED have a number of rules, which you can go and have a look on their website, ted.com, and you can look up TEDx events and or Google rules on there, and you'll find the rules on there. So it's things like no political kind of ramblings, <laughs> no sort of talks around religion or politics, no talk around them and us. We don't want the talks to be... They might need to be controversial, but they don't need to be putting someone else down mm. in order to make you good, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, what's the word? I can't think what the word is. I think my brain's gone from doing all my, uh, the <laughs> biking this morning. <laughs> you don't want to cause conflict from the mm. talk. So you have to be politically correct, I guess. You have to be very mindful that you need to say what you need to say without sort of offending everybody in the process by being quite sort of narrow-minded in your own thoughts. Because the point is, you want the audience to leave thinking differently. You want to plant an idea in the mind of the audience. Mm -hmm. And you want them to come away thinking differently about what they thought they knew about that subject. You want to challenge them a little bit on their current thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might not know anything about the subject, so you could be introducing it to them. Or they might know a lot about the subject, and actually you're going to get them to think about it in a slightly different way. And you've got your evidence there to back up why you feel that way, why you think that way. There's also a lot of rules around no pseudoscience and quantum physics. People want to talk about quantum physics and things like that. I mean, the rules were written quite a few years ago now, and there's more evidence coming out for quantum physics and all that kind of stuff. You know, the more what we would call probably more (laughs) woo-woo, what most people call more woo-woo stuff, they don't want that on the stage. Oh, okay. They don't want that on the stage because everything... When you have a speaker who's going to do a TED talk, we have to kind of check everything. Like, is this true? Mm. Someone's claiming something, but is that actually true? Where's the science behind it? Where's the evidence behind it? So you need to make sure that the person you're putting on the stage is credible and they've got the kind of evidence behind it. And that's probably one of the more time consuming pieces as as a curator is to look at those pieces and say, are they credible or not? Is what they're saying, does it have merit? Did that answer that question? Yeah, sure. yeah, it does. <laughs> and the, just as difficult as it is to get onto a TED stage, or not difficult, you know, the way you're curating the speakers and wanting something different for those ideas that are worth spreading and it's not motivational and not not motivational, my listeners know what I mean. The premise <laughs> isn't supposed to be a motivational speech. It's yeah. not supposed to be like, a mind hey, valley or something. I want to get on, the, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even so, mind valleys, I mean, sorry to interject, even yeah. mind valley stuff. I mean, I bought a few courses from mind valley because I love it. But, you know, there's one lady's course I bought recently and actually in her webinar thing, she's very educational and she explains and she shows you stuff she's done she actually has done a ted talk as well a tedx Mm. talk but she shows you why what she's saying is actually true and she does get volunteers on the stage and she gets them to do things Mm. so she's still backing it up with evidence she's showing you because at the end of the day it's like an argumentation it's like a convince you're sort of trying to convince somebody that your idea has merit and that actually you want them to go out there and tell other people about it because that's the point, ideas worth spreading. So it's like, what idea would you have that could impact the world? Yeah. yeah. That if people took it on board and told other people about it, look at like, you know, movements that go on Me Too and all those types of things. It's because there's a tipping point. There's a critical mass of people and there comes a tipping point where it tips over to being something that's talking about behind closed doors to actually we're going public with this now mm. because we've had enough. Yeah. So it's got to be more than just a motivational speech. It needs to move the audience. It needs to make them really want to take some sort of action or think differently. Yeah, and challenge the status quo. Yeah, challenge the status quo. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Well, how many were last year and what was the theme last year? And what is the theme this year? And how have you grown with your license from last year to this year? You've had it now seven years, I think, the license? No, it's four. This is the four fourth years. year we're going mm. to. Okay, so what was the first question? Hold on, there were three in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so how many speakers do you take on? 
because you want to challenge the status quo, but you don't want everyone to fall asleep. Is it a whole day event, a whole weekend event? So this is the other thing about why TED events are so amazing, right? We look for diversity. Mm. So say you went to a conference about, I don't know, maybe it is Mind Valley. I mean, I really love Mind Valley, so I'm not yeah. going to knock it and I'm not going to knock anyone. But if you went to a conference that was like, I don't know, a podcasting conference as, yeah. as an example, seeing as this is a podcast, you're going to get people talking about pretty much similar things, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So then you're sort of like, mm, okay. And it's hard for the speakers. They've got to think of something totally different and original and unique because there's loads of people talking about a similar thing. Mm. With a TED talk, the theme is brilliant. So the first year I got involved was Whip Up the Rule Book. Mm-hmm. Last year was, oh my gosh, Home. I was like, what was it? Home. And this year is Rhythm. Mm. Now, just to sort of ask, say the question about does TED give you the theme and everything, they don't, but we do have an online TEDx hub where all of the TEDx organizers and their team in the whole world are on and they all share ideas and look at each other and give each other support and help. So they give each other ideas about fun things to do at the event, entertainment, goodie bags, themes. So we all sort of share ideas, but it's down to us to come up with the theme ourselves. So when you have a theme like this year's rhythm, you can choose. The first thing that came to my mind when I think of rhythm is music, but that's because I've got this performing arts musical background. So I think music, Mm. but it could be algorithm Mm. and it could be patterns. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different ways people will interpret the word rhythm. And what we need to do is we need to make sure our speakers cover the whole gamut, the whole rainbow of different colors that you could have that would come from that word rhythm. So what we look to do is put on our stage a very diverse range of people that speak about a number of different things. And we've got quite a diverse range this year. I can't tell you (laughs) who we've got because we haven't released the speakers yet, but we have got a very wide range from engineering sort of through to health through to other things. (laughs) I won't go into too much detail, but you know, engineering and health, they're quite different, aren't they? So that's just two examples for you. So and how many speakers? How many speakers? So how many speakers? So that was the next question. So last year, I think we had 12 speakers. Mm-hmm. And so all the TED events are quite different. Some of them will be like a few hours. So they might only have a few speakers. Some will be half a day. Some will be a full day. So it just depends on a whole load of different factors. So there's no one size fits all with a TEDx event. We've got 10 speakers this year, hmm. so like nine or 10. The reason why we don't announce the speakers is we like to get into the coaching process with them. We need to see that they've signed speaker contract, they've signed their release forms, they're turning up to coaching calls, they start to commit and show up and start doing the work. And then in mid-July, we start to announce who the speakers are. And we do them one at a time, like a couple at a time. We don't do all of them in one go. We drip feed them out for Mm. our social media and our marketing and things like that. And it gives people a chance to like really digest who that speaker is and so on and so forth. That allows us time to see like the people to start getting into it and doing the work. And then people do drop out at that stage. People drop out. They go, shit, this is too much work. I can't do this. Oh, wow. I've got this. Yeah. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. I can't give this the time that it needs. Last year, I had a couple of people that said that to me and they dropped out. Such a (laughs) shame because they were epic speakers. And in a way, it's so great when they do do that because you know that they're the sort of people that they commit. And if they can't commit, they won't do it. Mm. This year already, I had a guy who was just phenomenal. And he said, I can't do it because it's on a Saturday. And I can't do it. If it was during the week, I'd do it. So he's dropped out, (laughs) which is such a shame because he'd be awesome. So this is the way it goes. Believe me, we've got a pool of people who are gagging to get on the TEDx stage. (laughs) And they will do anything to get on. So we never worry that much. We always know that we could probably pull a few people out of the hat and fill the slots or just go with eight or nine slots. They give people maybe an extra minute in their talk. So last year we had 12 speakers and people on average had around eight, nine minutes to do a talk. Mm. Now, it, TED Talks have to be under 18 minutes. So we gave them eight, nine minutes. Why? Frankly, people won't even watch something for 18 minutes anymore. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the attention span's gone tell out. I think goldfish have got a better <laughs> yeah. attention span than humans now. But we know that we want that YouTube video to be consumed quickly and we want it to be seen and consumed in its entirety. We don't want people to fall off halfway and get bored because they're not going to get to the end, which is the whole takeaway and the point of what they're saying. So that's why from the off, you've got to have something that's really punchy and compelling from the beginning to hook the audience and capture them straight away and then build your talk from there. 
so that's what we tend to do. I don't know what we're going to do this year with, I think we've got nine, 10 speakers. We probably give them like 10, 11 minutes, 10 minutes, but people always overrun always <laughs> without fail. No one speaks less than their time. <laughs> oh my no one God. can make it more concise, <laughs> even though they could. <laughs> no one does. I think it's really funny. Over the years, we've had speakers and they get like quite funny about it. They're almost like, well, I want my full time. Of, you know, and it's like the point isn't how much time you spend on the stage. The point is getting your idea across as quickly and concisely mm. and as impactfully as possible. So people can go, yeah, I get it. Great. I'm going to do something about this. Standing and talking for longer isn't going to help the cause. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, That's true. So is curating TED Talks for speakers your cusp business or is there more to expect from Mini in the future, perhaps more to do with kids or millennials? I really have this calling in me that I would love to develop something that I could take to younger people, maybe the next mm. generation. Because what I see is, it's so funny, even in like the few years that I've been in my business, people just do not want to get on the phone. They what? don't want to get on the phone. They rely heavily on texting, emailing, yeah. back and forth, back and forth. And it's just like, if you got on the phone, it would have been sorted in about two minutes. Yeah. But people seem to be frightened of the phone. The other thing is, no one really meets face to face. I mean, I like Zoom and stuff because it's quite good. You can speak to people all over the world and you can meet them face to face. But even that, I went to um, a networking meeting recently and they were like, oh, should we go and have a coffee? And even I was resistant to that because for me, it's like, if I sit and have a coffee with you, I've got to drive. I've got to actually look half decent. <laughs> I've got to get out of my workout gear finally from the morning. I've got to drive. I've, I'll meet you for coffee. And it's like, you need to sort of qualify that. So I don't mind going and meeting people for coffee, but I need to really know, like, are you just going to try and pick my brains for an hour, which is what mm. people usually do and want free coaching or whatever. So I can see why people don't want to meet face to face. But at the same time, I think we are losing a little bit of that connection. I've just been really mindful that a guy did a TED talk last year for us that was about taking a break from your phone and to consciously, you know, leaving the phone somewhere in the house when you're walking through the door and not looking at it and doing various things where you don't keep looking at your phone, like no phones at the dinner table and various things like that. Mm. And it's interesting because I've always felt that there was too much of that going on. And I know personally I'm guilty of it. I'm not trying to say I'm perfect and I don't do it because I do. <laughs> but I have noticed more and more that you look around and parents are on their smartphones and their kids are like looking at them. Yeah. And it's like you're giving more attention and love to your smartphone than you are your child. Mm. How is that making them feel? And then the other thing is children then don't really learn how to communicate with their parents. And suddenly they're teenagers and the parents are like, oh, they don't talk to me. It's like, well, you never talked to them for their whole life growing up. Why would they talk to you now? It's an alien concept. So I do feel like there's this lack of communication and lack of social skills going on. I mean, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I'm just going on what I've seen around me. Young people are quite nervous. I did a talk at a school a few months ago. And what was interesting is they were all literally on the edge of the seat, leaning forward and looking at me, which I, I to be honest, I was like, wow, I've really engaged because I was actually quite nervous about this talk. If I'm honest, I was quite nervous. And the reason I was nervous is I thought this is a hard group, age group to engage. They're either going to think, oh, get lost, douchebag, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, or you're really cool, but it's not, there's no in between. There's mm. no in between. They're not polite. They're not really going to, there's no mercy, right, for teenagers. I know because I was a teenager and I was just like horrible. <laughs> I would just be like, mm, I'm not right. <laughs> So I know what I was like. I think these teenagers were far nicer than I was at that age. But um, so I went along and I thought this could be a tough crowd. But actually, I just really tried to make it as relatable and ask them questions and things. And actually, they were really on the edge of the seat listening and they loved it. And the teacher came up to me and said, God, that was a brilliant talk. You really engaged them. And you know, we'd love for you to come and do another talk for us. So I, ne oh, I need wow. to follow up with her. But that's, I think I really enjoyed that. And I felt like if I can make a difference to this group, of people mm. this demographic then that's going to have the biggest impact in the world because it's like compound interest mm. you start it now at that age and you build upon that for their confidence so you could see them that this was for the young enterprise so they were going up and they were doing presenting and it was interesting because obviously the more confident ones were doing all the presenting and the others were just standing there shifting their feet around <laughs> and I just thought well, what about you guys you've got to step up at some point because how are you going to get a job interview? How are you going to speak to people at work when you get a job? Mm. What are you going to do? 
you know so I get quite passionate about that I think something needs to be done and I feel like well maybe it's me maybe I need to do something about it because I'm not seeing anyone else just from what I've seen, I mean, both being moms and everything, it's just that Generation X that have come with, haven't been born into social media or born into that communication. We were communicated with differently then as well. Our parents weren't that engaged with us either, but there was no social media. So in general, there's a lack of communication and how to communicate. So you're just literally holding something and communicating with something not knowing that it's not someone, but it's just something that you're communicating with. Mm. And whoever it is that's over there, and what I found really interesting or that with my kids is that they'll do it in a group. So they're communicating in a group, sitting with each other, not necessarily ignoring each other. They're still communicating with each other, but with an object in their hands. So it's just really cool things I find very exciting for us to learn new forms of communication because we've always been accustomed to how everything in life, we've all just been shown and conditioned on how to communicate. And now there's new ways to communicate. So we're able to expand our insight. We are being challenged as parents to challenge the status quo of what we know is communication. And if we're willing to actually step up, we bring our kids to a level that also step up. And they're able to then influence generations planting the seed. And there's the compound interest over there in the way communication is going to go forward. So maybe it's good the way you've been seeing things, you know, I've seen it, I've heard it all, all the talks and stuff, same on the podcast, I've seen, heard it all. And it's just like, yeah, 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 same, same, same. Give me something different, not something different, just give me a different angle. You challenge yeah, my exactly. status quo. Mm-hmm. You know, let me think about something different, even if it is a motivational talk, but let me think about it differently. We're such incredible human beings in able, you know, being able to do that. And yes, yeah, so I get just as passionate about it as well. So yeah. just <laughs> I think motivational speakers that go into schools and stuff, I think that's a great idea because I think it does help children understand, you know, they, they it's fresh for them. They've not seen that before. Yeah. And I think there's definitely a place for motivational speaking. I just think for the TED platform, wearing after a while. um, It's interesting because I got into the TED thing because I basically applied to do a talk. And then I realized that I didn't want to do that talk after all. (laughs) But the sort of idea that I had was around a lot of this stuff. And I felt like my idea was quite good, but I hadn't quite developed it yet. But actually, as I've become more involved with what I'm doing, this idea is sort of starting to take more shape. And the idea really was that in exactly what you've just said in schools and it's going to sound like I'm knocking schools here and and I'm not I think everyone has to take the responsibility the child the parents schools you know everyone society but I do feel that see at school they're so conditioned to behave in a certain way Mm. that by the time they leave school they're a neurotic mess and pretty much this is what this teacher said to me at this school that I spoke at she said these kids, because my talk was about, you know, my business journey and some of the things I've done in my life and the reasons why I took, made the decisions that I made because of the situations I had going on when I was younger. It was like, I need to leave. I need to do this. So this is the decision I'm going to make in this moment. This is the best thing for me right now. And not worrying about what the consequences were, consequences were because it's just like, well, I've got to make a decision. I've got to make a choice and I'm going to do that this now and that's what I'm going to do. Mm. But she said that the kids nowadays not just in her school but the kids nowadays are extremely worried about getting anything wrong they're very very worried there's a lot of pressure on them I don't know who from social media each other the media in general parents themselves their own belief that they have to be perfect I have no idea what it is but there's all these pressures and she said you know they feel quite stressed and your talk was really good because what you said was you need to stop worrying about that stuff and just do what you feel is right for you right now because that's all you can ever do you you don't know what's going to happen in five years time you know so just do what you need to do right now and I think we need to take the pressure off children a little bit so I don't know I think there's a great there's a great talk by Ken Robinson it's one of the top uh, 10 talks. Of yes. time. Do you know which one I mean? Yes, I do. He's got three. He's got three talks. He's got, oh, right. The one I love is the one about creativity in schools yes. and how we need to put more in emphasis on creativity as much as we do on maths and English and all the academic subjects. Yeah. Because, you know, even at my daughter's school, I see, you know, they, apparently they're not allowed to put key rings on the school bags because it is annoying to stack all the school bags in a box, which I can understand that's annoying. But at the same time, it's like... <laughs> 
let them be individuals if they want to have a whatever key ring on their school bag because then they know that's their school bag and that's their little thing that they take to school that's their one little thing what are you doing trying to turn them into a bunch of robots yeah it's just i don't know I don't but know. But that's good. That's good, Minnie, because it's firing you up. It's challenging your state. Oh, it really, it really so is. So it's like, I mean, oh, I'm coming, so I'm coming. I'm getting there. <laughs> I mean, my daughter's school is fantastic. It's one of the best schools in the area. It is really brilliant. So God only knows what it's like. But it's just like, they watched, they showed them a video about all the animals dying of plastic in the seas. And then the next minute, they're like, can you bring the back lunch in a plastic bag so we can just throw it in the bin? <laughs> no! What are you doing? Oh, uh, no, wait, I've got to tell you this one because this one, I was going to have such a rant on Facebook about this, but I had to just meditate for five minutes. But I'm going to have a rant to you now because I know you'll find this funny. They're having a cake sale to support Diabetes UK. <laughs> what? Is the irony not lost? Is the irony not lost? Is oh. everything vegan and sugar free? Sugar free, hopefully. Yeah, well, no, but the <laughs> oh, it's just like. Oh my God. Eating too many cakes leads to insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes. Oh my God. And they're talking about obesity in schools and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, that's where we need to come in. Sale or something else. Why don't they still sell stickers? Or, you know, (laughs) we get told, oh, anyway, I'll digress. But 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 that, that brings me to my next question for you. How do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you do? I don't know. I don't feel like I can do it on my own. I feel like I need a, an army of lunatics with me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. That's brilliant. <laughs> I do. I just feel like... Mini minis. Ah! Mini, mini, mini. <laughs> <laughs> Come, mini me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. How do I see I could change the world? One person at a time. <laughs> Starting with One, you. Starting with me. Oh, they say you need to be the change you want to see in the world. So that's it. it has to be the man in the mirror, as Michael Jackson said. <laughs> exactly so yeah I guess it does start with me I mean you know I'm not perfect I do try and do things every day and I think it's not being aware I think this is why TED talks are so brilliant or any talks if that vein one of my clients has just been accepted to speak at a platform called Ignite which is like a brilliant platform as well so they're not quite there with the level of what TED is and the quality of the videos and things like that but damn they've got a good idea and why not do it I'm all for like people wanting to get more of you know Joe Public out there to spread their ideas and their messages Mm -hmm. so yeah I just think one person at a time and you just got to start with yourself a bit but you know become more aware of stuff that's going on Mm -hmm. seek the truth in things yeah you know don't just take things on face value seek the truth and go hmm is is that true is that really true yeah you do that for your own limiting beliefs right if you can even spot them (laughs) (laughs) well when you get conditioned into it when you condition yourself into it in a good way then then things then you start seeing things we like when my son came home and he was like oh you have to drink milk because it's good for your bones and I said who told you that and he said well so school and I'm going is it true? Have you questioned it? Are you sure about that? Do you know that actually? And then he was like, ah, okay. So it was a little bit confused. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a friend of mine's speak and she said to me, did you know there's just as much protein, if not more, in a broccoli head as there is in a chicken breast? I said, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Yeah. So then I thought that's him. So I Googled it because I, I love anything to do with body nutrition. I've got a biology degree. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, but is it the entire range of amino acids? Because mm. you can only get the full range of amino acids from animal meat. Not that you can't get them from plants, but you probably have to eat a variety of different plants and know where all the different amino acids amino come from. That's right. So, you know, you'd really need to know your shizzle, <laughs> as I say. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and then it's like, okay, my brain hurts. I'm just going to go eat some fish or something. Um, But yeah, you know, question things, challenge things. Here's a really funny one for you. I love that you had that conversation with your son. So I said to my daughter yesterday, Emily, you need to get ready for bed. Let's go and have a shower. She doesn't want to have a shower. She only wants to have a bath. She has to have the bath really deep. So I said said to her, can you not? Because I said, what about all the water from the sea? I was just making up stories to her basically. But all the fish, what are they going to do? You're taking all the water from the sea and putting it in your bath. <laughs> and what about, you know, saving the environment and then the water bill and all, you know, all of that. Some people don't have water. I was just trying everything to get her to not have a bath at the end of the day. <laughs> just have a quick shower. Because really the reality is I wanted to hurry up, have a shower and get in bed, <laughs> go to sleep so I could get on with my stuff. And she turned around and she said to me, no, mummy, no, 
I have a choice. I have a choice. I don't have to have a shower if I don't want to. I have a choice. I can have a bath if I want. And I thought, right, okay. She's thrown my own stuff back at me now. What am I going to do? And I went, okay, you can have a bath. So, and actually, I compromised. I said, all right, started to run the bath. I said, why don't I do a teeny little bath and then you can have a shower as well. And as I'm washing your hair, the bath will fill up with the water. And then by the end, you'd have a bath. And she went, oh, okay. <laughs> So I just thought, well, this is great that I've actually instilled in her. She actually knows those words. I have a choice. Mm. And I'll tell you what, I never realized that when I was a child, even till God knows, probably quite recently. Yeah, <laughs> I hate to say quite recently. I think Going I always through. inherently knew I had a choice, mm. but I didn't consciously say it the way she said it. Yeah. In yeah. that way of like really owning it. I was like, well, okay gave myself a pat on the back felt quite smug <laughs> <laughs> oh but good on her well, good on her we start with our kids and we start with ourselves and then if I could develop something well not if then when I develop something I've got a friend who's a TEDx coach in the US and she said hey if you're going to do this idea that you've got I want to be in on it so there you go I was like okay <laughs> it's sorted it's organized yeah so yeah. Minnie we're coming to the end and I have a question where I ask all my guests to fill in the blank on three of my create three of my values. The first being um, creativity for you is creativity for me is oh, what do I want to say? Cooking. <laughs> <laughs> <You're hungry? laughs> I really love cooking, and I don't very often use recipes. Mm, I make same. stuff up, same. and my taste. I just know that might go with that and then I try it and sometimes mostly it works sometimes it really doesn't work and I have to throw it away and get a takeout because I've just fed up that I've spent so much time doing it but I think cooking is my space where I can and singing oh cool wisdom for you is oh wisdom for me is being quiet (laughs) (laughs) that's a good trait sometimes we need to be quiet as well passion for you is I think my thing that I'm most passionate about is my family. Mm. I think growing up in such a dysfunctional family and seeing all the stuff that went on with my mum and dad, I always thought, when, when are my real family going to come and get me? <laughs> <laughs> and then I always just thought I'd love to have what I wanted as a child as mm. my family. That was my number one goal. And I feel like I've achieved that. But you achieve it and then you have to, it's like losing weight. You can't just say, oh, I've lost weight now. You've got to keep going, you've got to keep running and keep it up. It takes work and energy. And sometimes you just think, go away, everybody. <laughs> Fundamentally, I'm so blessed, blessed and lucky and grateful. I love that. Minnie, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having really me. Really delightful. And lots of information to process as well. And for our listeners, if you want to know more about Minnie, you can have a look in the show notes, her favorite quote, book, her social media handles, website, and where you can get hold of her. And if you're considering wanting to partake in a TED talk and are needing a coach, Minnie is brilliant at what she does and does actually offer this service to train you and to give you direction and where to go and how to apply to give you the confidence as well. Thank you so much. And for everyone being here, And I'm going to see you or listen to everyone next week again, where we're going to delve into meeting new change makers who are changing the world by changing themselves first, fast and furious. Thank you everyone for being with us here today. And thank you, Minnie. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.